Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Full Tank Motorcycle Podcast. How's it going, Tim? It's going well. It's pretty cold here, so it's not riding weather, but it's nice enough. How are you? Not bad. I managed to sneak out a few times between cold days and wet days and whatnot. But the rest of the time, we've been staying warm by visiting motorcycle shows. And I think as a result, there's a few news stories that might have flown under the radar. So I thought we'd do a quick review this week of some that kind of caught my eye. Number one, then, is this one on MCN tin. It might be the end of Loud Exhaust. So there's a company that does car mods in Yorkshire or something. Yeah, in Wakefield. Mm. And they just got prosecuted, I believe, for offering a remap for cars that's called their Pop and Bang Remap Software Upgrade. So basically, I think what that probably does is adds a little bit of fuel, almost runs with too much fuel so that there's unburnt fuel in the exhaust system. And that's where it that's where Mm -hmm. you get the after fire, isn't it? And the after pops is is when that stuff just um, ignites because the exhaust system is hot. And it does sound cool. It makes the car sound like a rally car, basically. But this is like a huge moment, probably, because there's so many companies that exist that are purely there to make your vehicle you know massively in the biking world sound better but louder but maybe less sociable so do you think this is like yeah that's a polite way of putting it yeah what's your stance on here are you a loud exhaust fan or are you a stock exhaust kind of guy nowadays i used to get or quite like a loud exhaust Mm. and i used to want my car to have a loud exhaust when I first passed, of course, everyone does. And I wanted it to sound like a rally car, and the same with bikes to a degree. But I'll be honest, it was the just the second bike that I had that had a, a ridiculous, like a cheap exhaust. It was a Beowulf exhaust mm. on a Honda Hornet. And I absolutely hated it because you'd be sitting on, like, for most of what we're doing, it's like 40, 50, but sustained speed, right? Mm. And it would just bore its way into your ear, so you needed earplugs. Um, and it just wound me up a little bit. It was great when you were on song, you know, if you were actually, you know, um, doing something a bit more dynamic, it was not bad, but, uh, it was too loud. And then I have changed exhausts on loads of them. I think my favorite sound was like the V7, which actually wasn't that kind of abusive to your ears because it was a little bit lower yeah. in the register, which usually sounds a bit better, but I've gotten to the point where to be honest, I don't really care about the exhaust. I want to hear something cause I want that does it, it's just, it's a full sort of experience and it does feel lacking if you can't hear what what the bike's doing it helps you control it a little bit as well because you know what you're doing with the revs it encourages you a little bit more as well you sort of feel like you're going faster so i get wanting a noise but i think we've talked about this before i prefer it coming from the front like the airbox as opposed to the exhaust where it's behind your ear you don't really hear it and that's just for everyone else to annoy them so i'd prefer to have some sort of encouragement from the bike but probably from the front yeah like the mt09 we were talking about that at motorcycle yeah. live it's got the grills now in the top of the tank that were previously on the mt10 and so yeah legally it's still within the limits at the exhaust but in terms of the riding experience hopefully it's a bit more exciting because it's just piping it into your face yeah and i think i'm probably in a similar mindset to you now i used to have a really loud bike then i had a, l- a slightly less loud one and then now i'm sort of enjoying bikes that are a reasonable volume level um but just have like you say the right timbre and depth and growl to them yes um, but it doesn't necessarily necessarily have to be super loud. And I think that might be a change in the sort of riding I'm doing as well, because like you say, if you're doing steady miles or motorway stuff, it does become a bit irritating. It sort of makes me think of um, Jekyll and Hyde, who fitted, I had a Indian yeah. FTR as a long-termer, yeah. and it has a button where you can switch between. So it's closed by default, but then you hit the button on the bars and it opens a valve, and that makes it a bit louder. Um But it's got me thinking, like, if this company are now unable to legally sell something that just boosts the noise on cars, like, is everybody open to potential legal problems like Jekyll and Hyde, like the the kind of UK companies like Delcovic or uh, Black Widow, and even kind of major manufacturers, I think, are very cautious of this now. Like, they don't, you know, often exhaust, say, race only or track only. Yeah. Um, And anything that you do get that's aftermarket or like an accessory, sorry, from an official manufacturer tends to be pretty quiet now. And it's mainly for looks. And then the other thing that I've seen as well, you know, Triumph uh, a couple of years back with the Trident, they didn't even offer 
an accessory exhaust. They said they couldn't they yeah. couldn't find any performance benefits to offer to the customer. Like it wasn't worth developing something. It's kind of a rip off to charge a grand for a nice looking sure. pipe. But then recently they've come back with a partnership with Akropovich. And so the Tiger 900, for example, and probably some of the other newer bikes, you can get um, an accessory pipe now, which has been, you know, out of their range for a while. But now yeah. they're really emphasizing the looks, I think, and also the weight loss. Um, if you build it out sure. of titanium and carbon, you can probably shave off a kilogram or two, which is pretty significant, you know. So maybe this is it, mate. And also, like, what about individuals now? I know in the MOT already... They measure the sort of sound level quite casually. Oh, but I wonder if it's going this way and you'll end up getting in trouble. I would say I'm conflicted on it um, because I don't think... I've not noticed that it's a huge problem, to be honest. Like, it's... We've gotten this far with it being as loud as it is. And there is a restriction at the moment. You can't go above a certain amount, right? Legally, at least. They could still pull you over and go, your exhaust is too loud. Or, like you say, going through an MOT or, you know, when they're passing them through these things. So, yeah... One point is that manufacturers, you're right, like the, they're not, there's no performance uh, benefit to sticking on aftermarket exhaust. So the performance benefits, like you're saying, from Triumph is that it's a little bit lighter and, you know, so there is something at least that justifies going for it or it looks better, or it's smaller, whatever it might be. But yeah, I think they, I think that, well, I'm pretty confident they're going to take it too far and just say no noise from any vehicle, which uh, at some point, hopefully that's way off in the distance because I think that's unnecessary, to be honest, because vehicles make noise. And if they didn't make noise, you'd step out into the street more. I mean, like, that's what happens with electric cars anyway. Maybe, yeah. And also, like, the other thing that is a bit sad about it for me, I get it. Look, I get, like, when there's a really loud bike going past, I'm just like, Ugh, it doesn't need to be that loud. But the flip side is sort of, um, one of the things I love about motorcycling is all the little different interesting subcultures that people can get into and, like, the retro kind of custom scene that sort of um, centers around the bike shed and that kind of vibe. And then you've also got, like, custom cruisers. They tend to be quite loud and that sort of thing. And also, to some ex extent, like, sports bikes... They do sound good with a bit more of a rasp to them. And it just feels a bit like if people can't spend their free time doing stuff like modifying their bike to make something they're really passionate about and proud of. Oh, I'm probably being a bit like, woe is everybody or a bit dramatic. Mm. But it's like, what, what are you meant to spend your time doing? It feels a little bit like a sanitization of people's lives if they're not allowed to just express themselves yeah. doing things that they really enjoy. That's kind of the downside for me yeah. massively. Yeah. Uh, but I think you're right. There is a, there's a balance, isn't there? There definitely is a balance. And you're right. I think sanitization is a good word to use on that one. Um, and I think at a certain point, you're going to be taking it too far. And I think they probably will at some point, much like they have with the speed limits down to 20 in Wales, which... Oh, mate, we, I, I don't know if we've got time well, to get into that. Like. That's another article, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, people are very passionate about that. I think people will be passionate about this as well. But look, like you say, bikes are going to be naturally getting quieter as things move towards electricity. And we had a big story here, again, that maybe would just fly under the radar when you've got all these new Super Duke 1390s being announced and all this flashy stuff. But actually, I think mm. in terms of like where the market's going and what's going to be impor important in the next few years, this is massive. So... Mm. It's a press release from Honda, and it's their 2023 briefing on Honda electric motorcycle business. And these bullet points make for quite interesting reading, I reckon. So, number one, their global sales target of electric bikes in 2030. They originally set it at three and a half million bikes, but they've upped it for some <laughs> reason, thinking that that wasn't difficult enough, to four million. They're going to aim to sell four million electric bikes a year by 2030. Also, by 2030, they're going to introduce 30 electric models globally. That's a lot, mate. Hell yeah. <laughs> Impressive, yeah. They're going to further accelerate cost reduction initiatives to reduce the current cost of electric bikes by 50%, which I think that's one of the big... Look, there's two big problems people have with electrics. Three, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> number one no kind of soul compared to a petrol bike you're never really going to get around that any synthetic attempt to create that like the way that the harley live wire throbs at a standstill it's not the same and i think we just have to accept that number two is infrastructure like it's hard to charge 
that easily and you have to plan ahead a lot. But the more electric bikes on the road and electric cars, the easier that's probably going to get. So their goal is mm. to um, sell four million units by 2030 is probably going to help with that. And then number three mm. is the cost. Like zeros are like, or they used to be about 20 grand and a lot of them still are. The Harley S2 Del Mar that we're going to review in a week or two, that's not far off 20. And so comparatively versus an electric bike, like a 10 grand for an MT-09, that's an absolute who, it doesn't look great. And so this initiative to reduce cost by 50% definitely seems like an important one. And then they invest in 100 billion yen over the next five, or over the five years from 21 to 25, and another 400 billion yen over the five year period up to 2030 for a total investment of 500 billion yen over 10 years. I did the currency translation for that conversion rather, and it's uh, nearly three billion pounds, I believe. That's the sort of money I can't even get my head around as to whether that's a lot or not. No. It sounds yeah, like you a might lot. As, yeah, <laughs> you might as well have made up a word for the amount that makes sense to me. Um, there's a few things there. So in terms of like getting numbers out, they, they, I'd be interested to see how that sort of factors into their um, current figures of selling bikes, bearing in mind that a lot of their market would be the smaller um, things like the Cub and stuff, right? So um, I think in a year they sell the something like 20 or 30 million bikes globally. It's like okay. the, the second place manufacturer is one of the Japanese big four as well i think and they're more like five million it might be yamaha or someone mm. like that and it's all those little one two five bikes and scooters yeah. that they make that really make up the bulk of that um yes. but still and if they're doing electric bikes it's easy to do you know the smaller capacity ones or you know the equivalent of a one two five mm. so when they talk about numbers i guess my my initial thought was oh big bikes that'd be like the um mm. like the zeros and stuff but it's probably not if they're talking four million a huge percentage of that will probably be the little tiny ones so a good example of probably what they mean is in China, you can buy the electric version of the Cub. It's called the Cub E. And there's also a Dax E, I yeah. believe. Uh, so there's the Cub E, the Dax E, and then that Zuma looks like a Grom. Uh, not a Grom. What's that yeah. one called? A Ruckus in the US. Mm. Like a more utilitarian yes. looking thing. Thoughts on these? That looks like what I was expecting, to be honest. Yeah. And you know what? They're good fun, but... That is a city commuter, town commuter, short trip, like a good alternative to if you can't cycle or if you just don't want to and you want something a bit smaller. But yeah, I think like looking at these bikes as well, I agree they are sort of city biased. In fact, if you look at them, have they all got actual bicycle pedals? So they're more like an e-bike. Yeah. I mean, look at the... They have also, well. if, you, if you're trying to gauge the horsepower levels of a given vehicle without um necessarily knowing the full specs they're probably in here but like just glancing at it from the girth of that chain i'm thinking it's not a lot that's a bicycle chain <laughs> yeah it ain't, it ain't gonna be <laughs> okay, panigale well, levels is it so the two ways you normally do that at a glance are rear wheel size like tire tread mm -hmm. and then there the train is another one right um so for that that looks like a 50 cc to me that's pretty small but then if you have to use the pedals at some point if that adds some big whopping great tire on it and a fat chain then you'd need thighs like chris hoy to get that thing moving so i thought it's that a backup it, it, cycle it looks like a an e-bike but with all the added weight of a motorcycle but i can't quite figure out if they actually are pedals or not they do look like it don't they They're but i don't pedals, know if they just yeah yeah look, that one on the red one that's that's got a little yeah you can spin that round look it's got mm, room in yeah. there to actually pedal it the other thing that uh i was noticing on here though is that they say that their targets for pr operating profit for 2030 are 10 percent for all their motorcycle business and more than 5% for electric motorcycles specifically. So as a subdivision of that. And again, I think that's an interesting target because, well, look, it's different, isn't it? Because they're obviously doing all the urban mobility stuff, these smaller kind of bikes. But if you look at something like Zero, I don't think they've turned a profit in their entire existence. It's one of those kind of startup vibes where they just get loads of investment and hope that eventually at some point in the future, they might be profitable or worth something. And so I think it's difficult because obviously like this is, you know, it's not stamping out another CB650 or something like that where they've used the same engine for ages and they're just 
chucking another bike out with a different headlight on it. This is where you're having to put loads and loads of investment into developing something completely new. And so naturally, the costs are going to be super high. Um, and so if they can make it profitable, then it just becomes part of their core business. And that's when we'll probably see like a huge change. Um, but it's probably only Honda who can afford to do that because of that huge amount of bikes sold every year. The just sheer size of their business. They can actually afford to go for it and push hard. And so, look, I think this is a, a big moment where we're going to see the big change. If the biggest manufacturing the market is about to make a big push, then that's probably, it's time, mate. Time's up. That's a, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> time's up. Yeah, that sounds about right. I'd agree. And I think it could, I mean, it, it has to have been Honda to do that. It sort of feels like it's right up their street anyway. Still, I think we've got a few good petrol bikes left. So I'm going to rattle through some of the more interesting announcements over the past uh, week or so that kind of fell outside of the the shows. I mean, firstly, the KTM 1390 Super Duke mm. R was announced on Tuesday this week. So a couple of days after, or like a couple of weeks after Eichmer, a couple of days after Motorcycle Life. So a shame not to see it in the flesh there. But what's really interesting about this is they've gone for more and more and more power. It makes 190 horsepower now. So it's 10 horsepower upon the previous 1290 version. As you can imagine, they've done that by giving it a bigger engine, hence the name. Actually, only 49cc bigger, not 100, mm. but still, mm. it's bigger. And also, it's got variable valve lift, I believe. It's got some kind of like shift cam type thing. But it was a couple of years ago. The reason that they say they don't have a large capacity sports bike is because the kind of CEO of the Piera Mobility Group that owns KTM said that if your bikes are getting towards 200 horsepower, they don't belong on the street. There's no way you can use all that. And basically, bikes of that power only belong on the track. And yet now they've got a... 190 horsepower naked and so it's a bit like well does he mean there's a hard cut off at 200 <laughs> horsepower literally where he finds it yeah, acceptable 201 is too much where's the sweet spot mate um what's too much and what's fine in your books if his is 200 let's assume that's what he means i'd need to think what the most powerful thing i've sat on is and it, i mean the panigale v4 has got to be up there if it isn't the most powerful thing i've sat on it must be so it must be. From our day of taking them out, I can't say it felt like too much, but then that's because I went in with an element of reserve on my right hand and I didn't just completely grip it and, uh, and flip the bike. So it depends how it's handled. It depends how it's delivered. What I would say about when you get to that really, really high standard of, of horsepower, it makes you want to use it, basically. That's the biggest risk is that it's pointless because, yeah, if the speed limit's 70, you won't even have to try to get to lose your license speed. So, uh, I, I don't know, mate. basically any bike I've ever had, and I'm sure you're the same, you'd be like, oh yeah, this is great. The first time you take it out, you're like, this is all I need for power. This is, why would anyone need anything more? And then you own it for like a week or something. Maybe it's even just in that day. By the end of the day, you're kind of like, yeah, I could take a bit more. When you get up to 200, I think he's got an argument there. I think 160, MT10 is like 160. And that felt about as fast as you would ever need from a bike. So... Probably 150, 160 is kind of the sweet spot for me. The sweet spot where you can use it yeah, all. Uh, you still can't use it all, but yeah, basically, yes. Yeah, that Panigale V4, I think, is the most powerful bike I've ridden as well. We were out there on a Ducati media day. I think it was interesting that both of us actually probably preferred the... We were swapping between the Panigale V4 and V2, weren't we? Back yes. and forth. And I think both of us actually preferred the slightly smaller bike and also because you're not using that extra 50 horsepower yeah. or so it didn't really make any difference no. to me it's um i've just looked it up actually so the panigale v4 i believe is about 210 211 ish around that it's over 200 so it's over his threshold for this should be on a track and i would say he's probably right because the thing is um you hear this from people who do race from people who really genuinely do know as opposed to two idiots um that you know they sometimes they'll prefer something like a 600 to a thousand cc because they can use all of it you've said what the most powerful bike you've ridden is though but like what's the most enjoyable like if you can think of everything that we've reviewed <laughs> and stuff like really the question is you said where the sweet spot is but yeah. i don't know if it is around that point like is there a bike that you can remember where you're like i'm just having the most fun on this it could be one that you owned as well. In recent memory, some of the days that I've enjoyed most, but it could be just the full conditions of it. I think everything goes into it. It's riding the right bike on the right road. 
So if you have a sports bike and you're on a track, it'll fight, it'll feel really exciting. But if you're on some B roads, you probably want something a bit smaller. And as weird as it's going to sound, but one of my favorite bikes or experiences recently was the uh, CF Moto little uh, sports bike there. I think it was a 300. It can't have been more than a 400. Um, and we took that over the roads in Spain, which were absolutely back to back switchbacks, which you know all too well. And of the bikes that I tried on that day, that was one of my favourites because you could absolutely full throttle the thing on every have almost every corner, and um, yeah, you could you could have a great time with it. So that was, I mean, that's got to be like forty horsepower or something. It's something smaller than that, but real small capacity. But it's more about is the bike appropriate for the conditions? I guess it loops back to his theory: over two hundred horsepower, track ready bike. But uh, under that, then you can still use it on the road. So. That was one of them. For another one for me, the V7 was just really satisfying for me because it felt like you were really engaged in what the bike was doing. Um, like I had a street triple, but it felt like the bike was doing was making me look good. Whereas with mm. the V7, if I was riding well, I could take full satisfaction that I was a part of that system. So, <laughs> Despite the bike, <laughs> you were still yeah. going at a decent... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do often do the run to Silverstone and back because there's lots of motorcycle manufacturers there. And I go the same route through the Cotswolds and it's not necessarily like the best roads and the best surfaces, but it's just a bit of everything. You know, there's some tight turns, there's some longer ones, there's some slow bits, there's some quicker open bits, there's some single lane almost with a bit of like wet road and gravel and bumpy bits. Then there's some nice smooth bits and it's good, you know, a couple of hours each way. So you get a bit of an idea of comfort levels as well. That's really interesting doing that a lot picking different bikes up because it's almost like the most it's the closest i can get to like a controlled test obviously the weather might differ the traffic mm. uh, but there's a bit of motorway at the end as well and i just always think like the best rides like sometimes i've got that crummy old sv 650s that i use to drop off there and leave it in a garage for with one of the manufacturers whilst i bring one of their bikes i can borrow it mm. and the rides there on a simple bike like that with a sporty position 70 horsepower ish are really fun because exactly like you say with the v7 if you're going quick then you feel like it's more down to you and yeah. also the feeling of like having it wide open is fun as well yeah. um and you don't get that experience so much on the on the quicker bikes all right so we're saying s between 40 and 70 horsepower <laughs> uh, yeah uh, yeah to be honest for what i don't I've... think many people that agree with that <laughs> i'd say to be honest i mean what's mine like 94 on the uh, africa twin it is context dependent right because mine's a heavier bike so that needs 100 horsepower to make it fun if it was 70 horsepower on that bike it'd feel a little bit sluggish so funny um, though actually my tiger 800 is the other bike that i do that run on quite a lot yeah and more often than that, I feel a bit dissatisfied. It just needs another 10 or 20. It's like, like you say, heavier. It's got all the cases on. It's not as aerodynamic, yeah. I guess. And yeah, that, that makes about 90. And sometimes I just think like I've got it wide open and it's just not as <laughs> quick as I'd expect. Maybe that's yeah. why they made the new Tiger 900, 110 horsepower-ish. Something mm -hmm. around that area, isn't it? It actually yeah. sounds quite good. All right, well, yeah, okay. Context is the ultimate conclusion there. Thank you, Tim. It depends on the road, depends on the bike, depends on how you feel that day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other bike that we are kind of interested in at the moment is the new BMW R12. We touched on this recently at the la end of the last episode. Um, but I was kind of thinking about this one. It's been, you know, settling in a bit. It's one of the most interesting new bikes this last week or so. Mm. And I was like, I actually think it looks cool. And I don't know if they achieved that with the R18 that came before it. Mm. They certainly didn't with that R1200C that came before that. Yeah. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Is it actually a cool bike? And does it mark a change for BMW in which they can successfully move into that cruiser market? Because I don't think the R18 has actually sold that well. Yeah, I'd say it definitely puts forward a stronger case to move into the cruiser market. Yeah, because it's not really a cruiser it's kind of like a halfway it's like a mix of things it's a kind of hybrid which is great um because they haven't just copied someone else it offers something genuinely new or different from the competition so rather than just having you know different flavors uh slightly different flavors on a, on a similar recipe you've got something which could potentially be genuinely very different to its competition so that excites me i guess because it is I know it's going to be or feel different to anything else I've ridden, which is always a, a fun proposition. Um, so yeah, I'm excited by that. I think it's. Uh, I think it'll do well for him. 
Right, let's get the configurator open, but we'll just do one screen shared. Whoop. This is how to spec the perfect R12 to make it look really good. Here we go. This is gonna be a work of art. First decision that you're gonna have to make is the color. And there are only three options. I've got to say, some manufacturers do this really well, like Royal Enfield, there's like eight colors for each bike. Yeah. Like Triumph and BMW, there tends to be two or three. And one of them's always black, which is fine. It does look quite cool, but here's the other mm. ones, mate. Red with a bit of black. Mm. I prefer the, well, yeah, no, I prefer the black. Let's have a look at that black again. Or I know which one I'm going to go for. That's option 719. For, right? Option 719. Maybe, but it's another 2,100 quid. It's taken a 12 grand bike already up to 14. The only thing I don't like about this is the gold handlebar, I've decided. Look, this paint on uh, the back yeah. here looks great. I like the yeah. little mudguard there. The tank paint job's very nice as well. But I'm wondering, next step, right, pillion package or do you just go solo, mate? <laughs> well, solo. the wife never comes on the bike with me, so I can just go solo for me. Lovely. Also, by specking up that paint job, which I just said added two grand, you do get the yeah. fancy uh, exactly. cylinder head covers, uh, rocker covers, rather. And then also the billet pack, which gets you bar and mirrors. Yes. Maybe the levers and the reservoir caps. And I think it looks like foot controls are on some billet parts as well. Mm -hmm. Equipment. This is the big one, mate. Do you go cast wheels? No. Um, no. <laughs> Almost certainly not. I agree. Click it. Black spokes. Quite nice. Or gold spokes. Th that's Ooh. a real tough one for me. Someone asked me on the video, by the way, are they tubeless? Uh, yeah, tubeless now. I think the spoke wheels on the previous Gen R9T were tube yeah. type, which is definitely a downside. They, I think, are tubeless. In fact, I clicked mm. on the configurator and they are. The gold is a bit bling and looks a bit adventure bikey, and it always looks good yeah. on adventure bikes. The black, I actually think, maybe looks better. Yeah, I think for a cruiser, definitely. It makes the wheel almost look a little bit bigger as well, which is quite nice, as in the tyre, sorry. Yeah, like a, a bobber look, like it's got yeah. a chunkier tyre. I see what you're saying. Oh, we've already got the design option exhaust system. I don't know what that means. Heat grips? Nah. Nah. Bluetooth? 280 quid? That's steep. You bothered? Bluetooth? No, mm. I've used with, with the ones I've used in the past. No, it's unnecessary for me. I don't know if we talked about this at the show, but you can replace the analog dash with mm. this mini TFT. It's only three and a half inches mm. in diameter, but basically it gives you a digital display. There you go. Mm. You see that? Yeah, I did. I analog? prefer the clock, I think. Yeah, analog for me. Do you? What do you think? Yeah, what do you think? Oh, for 120 quid. I think that's not bad. Like, I'm surprised it's not more than that. But okay, we'll go analog. You're old school. I love that you're just accepting my position on this one. You don't want to uh, fight me on it. I agreed on the wheels. I feel like... in di I, I think I probably functionally prefer that digital dash, but from a mm. aesthetic perspective, I think you're right. Cruise control for zero pounds. Obviously, I'm going to yeah. add... Oh, you have to add the <laughs> comfort zero. package. This is the thing, right? It says it's zero pounds to add cruise control, but... You have right. to actually get it as part of the comfort package for £980, which gets you quick shifter, heated grips, cruise control, and hill start. I am not really that bothered about heated grips on a bike like this. It's not really a bike you're going to ride through winter. No. It looks too nice. Quick shifter, probably would prefer. Cruise control, almost certainly. Hill start, absolutely not bothered. But look, I've had to add it. And then <laughs> you can add a power reduction. You'd probably need that, mate. <laughs> Uh, but that's down to A2. Yeah. TPMS, probably not that bothered. Headlight Pro, it's like cornering headlight, probably not that bothered. Going to ride it in the summer. Anti-theft alarm, not sure I'm not bothered. Ding! Oh, jeez. £15,920. It looks good though, doesn't it? I'm happy with that. Yeah, I'll take that on. I agree with you. The only thing I would change on that is the gold bars. I would put them to black for sure. But everything else I like. I thought it was good value, this bike, versus the Triumph at least. Like at, at 12 grand starting price, it's not bad. Yeah. I know this is like such a cliche to say that uh, BMWs really rack up the, the squids when it comes to uh, accessorizing and stuff. But that is pretty impressive. Now, look, the R12 is definitely cool. I don't know if you saw this, but my question now is... Is this bike cool? It's the Royal Enfield I Shotgun we were going this direction. 650. Like, I remember when I was um, a young warthog, uh, I used to go out on the back of my dad's Bullet 350, and I really yeah. enjoyed it. Like, I thought it was super fun. But I wouldn't necessarily say that I thought that Enfields were like what you would typically state as cool bikes. You know, mm. that was at a time when, like, sports bikes in the 90s and stuff and uh, were, like, very popular and 
deemed to be cool and like naked and stuff. Enfields were like, you know, for the classic enthusiast and that sort of thing. And the retro scene wasn't really a thing, was it? It was like you probably mm. like classic bikes and went to classic bike shows and stuff like that. Or there was the more modern edge. Retros have become a thing. And then I think Enfield have very much been in the sort of like old school looking area for mm. a while. But this is a bit of a change, isn't it? It's got the kind of like old school stance. Mm. But actually the finish on it is almost contemporary. And it has me wondering, are Enfields now deemed to be cool bikes? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm contractually obligated to say yes. Oh, um, <laughs> Tim's, Tim's got a vested interest here, just for full disclosure. I have, yeah, don't take my opinion. This is not an objective viewpoint at all. His employers no, it, just it took on, you have to stay, <laughs> his employers just took on Royal Enfield as a, they're a dealership now. Did it. But I do not mince my words. If I didn't think it was cool, I would probably just say nothing. Um, but if I think it's cool, I will say so. And I, I would say, uh, yeah, with the advent of uh, cafe races, although obviously we're sort of shifting out of that now, it's becoming less popular. We are drifting, we think, back into kind of sports bikes and adventure bikes. 90s being, vibe, yeah. The, yeah, for the cafe racer, that style of bike, yeah, absolutely, I think Royal Enfield are now... Uh, considered cool and I think a lot of that comes from the Interceptor 650 they had a bit of a niche kind of following with the bullets and stuff like that beforehand and people kind of um, they would customise them you'd always think that it looked good but now they can actually perform in there uh, for me at least they're more fun to ride so yeah with the the twins with this engine actually in particular um, I think they've they've kind of turned their the opinion on them a little bit. The finish is coming up a little bit more as well, and you can customize them to the nines, so you can make it look like whatever the hell you want it to look like, basically. So that's yeah, what they were saying with this bike. They're saying that they've designed it to be kind of modular. This is the SG650 concept, which they've sort of Ooh. based it upon. Yeah, they based it on that. That's that was cooler. at Eichma a couple of years back, maybe. Um, but with this, um, this is a run of 25 bikes, but it is probably what the production version is going to look like. You mm. can actually, um, quite easily fit a rear rack so you can carry some luggage. And then on top of the rear rack, you can actually just with a key, like add the, um, passenger seat. So it's kind of like interchangeable, almost in the way, do you remember the street scrambler from Triumph? You used to be able to switch between a rear rack and a passenger seat. Mm-hmm. It's like yes. that, but you can totally remove the whole rack and subframe and have it in mm. this single seat setup. Proper cool. I like that. I think it's a nice idea. As for the paint job, mm, I do really like it. I hope they don't kind of, because this is a, a limited run of 25 bikes, which are probably already sold out. They're going to have to leave this one. It's not going to be obviously carried over to the production version, which I assume will be yeah. announced in the next few months. But I hope they don't go too plain and conservative after this. I hope they do something similarly punchy because it's like a cool new direction for them and a lot more like lo less relying on the sort of old school image and more kind of moving into something a bit obviously fundamentally it's an air cooled twin and it's not mm. got bleeding edge tech or anything but looks wise i like where they're going with it and the other thing that was announced recently was the pricing as well on the himalayans that came out from them I think this was announced while we were at Motorcycle Live the other day, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yeah. Himalayan 450. Looks like a big leap forward. Mm. And I believe each variant... Let me just double check this because I don't want to get it wrong. But I believe they're coming in around the seven grand mark, which is going to make them look very, very tempting. Yeah, I agree with that completely. I, I'm really interested in this bike. Um, and this is one I could I could happily see myself on that. The only thing I will say about that is that um, yeah, I don't necessarily dig the looks on it. It's not really my cup of tea. I think there are adventure bikes that I think we both agree pretty much that the Africa Twin is kind of is our benchmark normally for adventure bikes looking cool. Mm. Um, and I think this is somewhat missed the mark as far as looks go, but as far as performance and um, knowing its market, I think, as well. I think they've done really well. Obviously, we, we enjoyed going and doing the old Himalayan day uh, and doing the adventure riding on that, and both agreed that actually the power, although that one is fairly modest, um, felt fine when we were on green lanes and stuff. Didn't feel like you we lacking for power or wanted a lot more. So this one having, it's probably near sort of double the power, um, is a really really appealing proposition to me i got that slightly wrong i said seven grand it's actually um around six so five thousand seven hundred and fifty for the base brown model 
Uh, another hundred quid for the white, is it? And then the mm. poppy blue, it's called. Summit Hanley Black must be a premium job. And then there's, yeah, that's the one with the gold rims and uh, a splash of gold. And then there's the yeah. Camat White and Hanley Black. They're like different versions. Uh, those top two get tubeless tires, uh, mm. and they're six two fifty and six three hundred. So you basically got a five hundred quid ish range there, uh, yeah. depending on finish. Uh, I think almost certainly I'd have to go for tubeless uh, on this bike, and also yeah. they look great. Those tubeless tires. That's on the sort of um, almost topographical scheme that we really liked at the show. Yeah. It's good value that I think the four one one, the previous gen Himalayan, was around the four seven fifty mark. So obviously it's a bit of a step up, but it's a massive improvement in performance. You basically got double the power, mm. and so I think it's going to be a lot more appealing. Definitely. Mm. I guess, what does it go up against? KTM 390 Adventure, yeah. potentially? Uh, yeah, in my mind, that's an easy comparison. Maybe the BMW uh, G3, GS 310? G310 GS. So let's have a little look. I think for a 390 Adventure, you're looking at 6.5 grand mark, 6599. And they do appear to be, I think that's a little bit more premium spec but they're not a million miles apart. No. Scrambler 400, if you want something with a bit more of an old school look to it, mm. is 5595. So that's still yep. looking very good on price. That's also mm -hmm. a single around the 40 horsepower mark. Uh, but yeah, obviously it doesn't get the screen and probably not as off-road capable. And then the G310 GS, again, not as off-roady maybe because you've got the cast wheels, the wheels yep. aren't as big, but that's 5, 8, 90. So there's lots to choose from there. The, the mm. KTM is definitely at the top end, but it gets things like um, a TFT dash that has quite a lot of yeah. functionality. Suspension is really good because it's WP, which is their in-house stuff. Um, which of the bunch would you pick? If I was going off-road, it'd be the Himalayan. If I was taking one off-road, seriously, it, I wouldn't even, it wouldn't even be a question for the other ones. That is more off-road capable. If I was going for road riding, then you're right. The KTM offers a little bit more functionality. Um, so what, could you live KTM. with the looks on that, though? Well, no. But uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> if, I was, I mean, if I was going for pure vanity, which is my normal stance, then I'd be going for the Triumph because it does look very nice. But... Mm. Uh, yeah, I think it, genuinely, if I was going off road, there is only one I would consider out of that bunch, and it would be the Himalayan. I think I'd agree. Road riding, the Scrambler looks pretty cool. Himalayan on the other side looks great. And the pricing, mm. yeah, isn't a huge difference. So take your pick. Last one I wanted to just talk about as well, speaking of Triumph, was the, the brand new Triumph motocross bike, which they've announced the full details of. The price comes in at just under 10 grand. It's really hard for me to judge whether this bike looks good or not. Apparently, it's very, very different in terms of the frame design to the norm. So I think the Japanese motocross bikes that are similar competitors to this use aluminium frames like that. So maybe like the, the Yamaha WR or something like that. I believe the European built bikes, so that would probably be like KTM, Husky, Gas Gas, yeah. use like a steel frame. So it's kind of different. Uh, but also the frame design is specific to Triumph and also the engine design is specific to them as well. So it's not just licensed out from like an existing manufacturer and then just slap mm. a Triumph logo on it. So I think that's, mm. I mean, they had to do something to differentiate it because the, the Triumph brand has no history in motocross really. And so mm -hmm. you couldn't just license a, a design and put the badge on because it just wouldn't mean anything. And so mm. what you've got to do, I guess, is bring something that actually has some sort of specific performance characteristics to it that make it mm. appealing, hopefully, or some kind of innovation or like developments. I guess what is interesting about this, mate, though, is like they did send the press release to me, but it feels like a completely different audience. I don't think anyone that watches my channel is realistically going to be considering just buying a, you know, this isn't road legal either. It's not like uh, one of those Enduro type bikes that comes with like the headlight and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah true no no this is a pure either. you know track bike it mm. feels like a completely different audience and i'm not that familiar with the motocross kind of media but i googled it earlier and tried yeah. to find articles about it just to see whether people were like impressed with it on paper mm. i couldn't really get a gauge of like whether people think that this looks like a good design or not it looks cool i can it tell looks, you that yeah it looks the same as other motocross bikes that i've seen but so. that's to the untrained eye isn't it Sure. I don't think there's, I, I genuinely don't think there's as much um, difference or contrast between the overall look of any of those bikes. There's mm. little bits, but I, I think largely they look the same. If you took off all the badges on that one, I'd 
guess that it was maybe a new Husqvarna or something like that. Um, yeah, I don't. I honestly, I don't even know if I could wade in on the the question of it. Really, I think my my guess would be this will sell off the back of performance, and I mean in the same way that people buy the race bikes because they want to feel like they're getting some piece of what their favorite racer is using. If mm. they started competing with this and it started winning in those circles, then I think people will buy it. But um, yeah, nearly ten grand for a dirt bike. Um, I don't know. It's a different. It's a very different audience than you or I. So well, I mean, that just really depends on um, you know the other options on the market. It's hard for us to gauge yeah. whether that's good value for not. It seems like the comments though on their launch video are like really positive i know like probably there's some management of that potentially yeah. <laughs> but I th people aren't afraid to let brands know if they think it looks kind of um sure. subpar but generally yeah. hopefully some of these people are from an mx background yeah. and like scanning through i was finding it hard to find anything that looks particularly detrimental but i yeah. think you're right it really will come down to the racing look someone's like can't wait to see it in supercross um, yep and I think that's what it comes down to. Yeah. I love, though, this new Triumph Racing Yellow that they've started introducing across some of their bikes. Um, yeah. That's the kind of like a, a recent decision to have this um, very punchy yellow color as one of the options. Mm. You can now get it on the Trident look as a little accent, which mm -hmm. I, I just think it, it almost gives them a pop. That's on the Moto2 Street Triple Edition. Mm. I believe they'll be using it on, yeah, anything that's kind of like performance-based. Yes, that makes sense. But it almost gives them like a signature color now that's really popping a yeah. la KTM with orange, for example, where yeah. it's not, it's very noticeable. And it's similar to some of the Yamaha designs that they used to have, like the fluo. Is it fluo yellow? It's sort of a kind of a yellow on the MT10s oh, and uh, MT. There you go. This one? Yeah. On the wheels. Yeah, it's a very similar color scheme. But I, I don't know if that was ever like, if you think of like Yamaha's racing color, it's blue in it yeah no it's, it's nice i guess I what they're doing they with that. like a signature color like that before what it looks like is that they're doing um like you say if it's race ready or if it's got some sort of race pedigree attached to it maybe that's the color they use to sort of call that out which is really cool and then triumph always used to do really bright garish colors when you're thinking of like the speed triples and stuff that came out originally and street triples and things the idea was that they went as loud and as wacky with the colors as they could so yeah. it's nice to see it come back. Ah, it's got me thinking though. It's like, yeah, great. You've got a signature color now. That is great. And it's very noticeable and punchy. And it goes well with like the Triumph logo and it makes the bike look quite cool. But there's only value in having like a really recognizable signature color if you get good results, like you were yeah. saying. It literally does all come back to that, doesn't it? You've put a target on your back, basically, haven't you? Yeah, And I think <laughs> with this, uh, yeah, 100% with this kind of bike, because it is a new foray for them to go into, um, yeah, they need to come out of the, the gate um, quick. Swinging. They need to come out swinging, yeah. All right, well, thank you very much, Tim, for your accompaniment on that Odyssey through some of the more perhaps niche motorcycle news stories over the past few weeks, but I did enjoy a little look at some of those in depth. As always, thanks to everybody for listening. If you're on audio, you've got YouTube where you can see full episodes with video or the Clips channel as well, where you can see our little highlights pulled out. On the flip side, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, you do have the option <laughs> of going to your favorite podcast player and just listening to us. If you're out doing the gardening, on a ride, maybe a long drive, pass the time with myself and Tim. But anyway, we'll be back soon. I think, Tim, you're coming to the studio next week so we can review this um, live wire s2 del mar which i'm really looking forward to so we'll probably do an episode around that yeah so yeah look forward to speaking to everybody then see you soon bye